And now I have the honor to introduce Eckhard Modro, our final keynote speaker. Eckhard is a professor from the University in Göttingen, where he is heavily involved in teacher education and also runs classes about computer science for non-computer scientists. Why we wanted Eckhart to have or to give this keynote is because he's one of the biggest SNAP advocates in Germany and he's the guy who helped us bringing SNAP to German schools. He's super active in SNAP. He wrote a book about it for, with project ideas for high school um, teachers. He in, created different versions of SNAP about SQL with machine learning and so on. And in this keynote, Eckhart wants to reflect on his experiences with project-based learning and how he helps students to create meaningful projects. I will now play Eckhart's um, talk. Oh, I have to unshare, sorry, I forgot to share with the audio thing. Um, share computer sound. Okay, dokie, careful. I will now play my video. Maybe remove your headphones a little bit and let me know if it works. Hello, dear SNAPCOM participants. Greetings from Germany, almost still in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, I speak very bad English. So that you understand something at all, I will read this talk partly from the page. The title for this talk is The Tool is Not the Topic. I will briefly explain how this title is meant and then give some examples to illustrate the procedure. Have fun. In fact, I am an old physicist and teacher. And to be honest, I am much more interested in physics than in computer science, except for one point. It is practically impossible for beginners in physics to develop and realize completely new ideas of their own. The physical methods are simply too sophisticated and the tools available are either tricky experiments or math and neither is necessarily part of beginner's knowledge. Consequently, physics beginners can usually only repeat given experiments or apply physical results, the formulas, to standard situations. Neither has much to do with creativity or imagination, and accordingly physics is unpopular, unfortunately. The situation is completely different in computer science. The efficiency and speed of computers make it possible to realize and test even the first completely half-baked ideas, to test and improve their effects. It may then take a few minutes instead of milliseconds to perform a calculation, but what does it matter? The development of own approaches for self-chosen projects is no exception in computer science. It can be the standard method, also possible for quite normal pupils. From a pedagogical point of view, computer science is a far more interesting subject. It can be like other creative subjects such as art or music in the way it works, only in a completely different area. Computer science can be like creative subjects, but does it really? If we talk with students who have finished a programming course, they know a lot about Java, C or Python, but they haven't solved their own problems yet. The tasks in the course were mostly only used to illustrate special syntax characteristics or data structures. So the students got to know the details of a tool with which you can do something later. If this later doesn't come, then the course was actually completely senseless. So, if we teach beginners in programming who will not later get into computer science in depth, we must be very careful that the programming tool taught doesn't dominate and displace the actual purpose of the course. This applies to schools as well as universities. Experienced teachers will now argue that it is complete nonsense to let beginners choose their own tasks. 
They can't do that yet because they haven't learned what works and what doesn't. Of course, that is true if you don't specify anything. 99% of little boys will end up very quickly in shooting games and 99% of little girls in unicorns and flying cars. The other two will try to fly to Mars. But there is another way. We can provide a context in which a search for our own task takes place. This could be a smart home, that is a doll's house with sensors and motors, a toy farm, a knight's castle, a greenhouse or a zoo. Such examples come from the field of physical computing. Robots are also part of it. Take the zoo. There you can make sure that nobody enters the lion area while the lion is still outside. That the giraffes get food when they go to the feeding house. That disabled visitors can easily use a suitable entrance. That children can buy ice cream, but not too much. In all these cases, a senior value is evaluated, which, is ne if necessary, starts a motor or switches a lamp. We do not need to set tasks in this context. Every child can come up with much better ones very quickly. And no one will come up with the idea of flying elephants to Mars. This has a nice side effect. The children help others. They develop ideas and learn to make life easier for people or animals. I like that much more than murder games or love stories. By the way, programming becomes more interesting for both genres, and there's nothing wrong with a cool story. The model can also be transferred to older pupils or students. Here, too, there are contexts which, on the one hand, show what can be done and, on the other hand, limit the space of possible problems. A possible context is always one's own field of study. Of course, novice programmers can't estimate how their own programs can be used in the subject, but they can judge how programs can be used in a specific case to simulate an experiment, to evaluate a survey, to prepare data, to analyze texts. All we need then is a tool that is suitable after a short introduction and mostly does not appear as a separate topic. And that's where we are at SNAP. As an example, we choose the simulation of a physical experiment. The path of electrons is to be observed in electric and magnetic fields. A typical experiment for beginners. All we need are the graphical properties of SNAP for the experiment setup and simple animations. For example, to show or hide parts or values. You will just try it out without much code and use SNAP, for example, as a drawing tool. Then the physical behavior of the electron is simulated and only the physical behavior. The necessary scripts are short, concentrated on the technical essentials on the experiment. SNAP as a development environment disappears behind the problem definition, enables the simulation, but does not dominate it. For many years, I have been giving a lecture programming for non-computer scientists in which students from really all faculties are sitting, but no computer scientists. Since SNAP has been around, I have acted as, as if the programming language doesn't matter at all. Instead, problems are solved. The way of work is. The problems come from the student subjects. The level of difficulty increases slowly, but starts as a level where you can work meaningfully. For example, the basic algorithmic structures are used simultaneously. The project starts almost always with an empty SNAP project. During the lecture, a basic project with some functionalities is created. The development of this project was accompanied by the students. Within this project, the students work independently. They extend, complete and improve the project. SNAP is treated as a toolbox, whose use in the current context is explained by the basic project. 
If you don't find a suitable tool, here is SnapLock, then you have to develop it yourself. The students know that the details of the programming environment are kept intentionally in the background. If necessary, however, details are of course dealt with, but not without need. At the end of the lecture, all students choose a problem from that su subject and develop a small application. Although it is a programming lecture, the focus is always on the problem to be solved, not on the tool. To solve the problem, you use computer science methods that are formulated in the tool you are working with. The tool doesn't have a meaning beyond that. In the following, I would like to show some examples from the lecture. Let us first deal with ants. All we need is a nice ant that walks around in the area. In our case, this is supported to be the desert. And as we know, it is yellow. The script for this ant is very simple, but we can extend it in different directions. It is a script for beginners. The stage is cleared and the ant moves forever two steps and turns in a random direction. If on edge, it bounces. In the desert, the ant, which is now a desert ant, must survive. To do so, it needs a place to live, the ant hole, here, and something to eat, this time a dead bug. That's what the ant is looking for now. When she finds it, she takes a bite and runs straight to her hole. But how does she find it? Students can find information on the net under the keyword desert ants. The famous fluorescent ants were fluorescent colors. They are active at night, as you can see. When they smell something interesting, maybe an oil well or a lost house key, they run slower than normal. This results in beautiful photos with long exposures. And we can use several arms if we create clones. Several arms form arm trails with the help of pheromones, which evaporate in time. From the size of the pheromone drops, the ants can determine the direction of, to the bug. Information on pheromone traces also can be found on the net. If they find a forest, the desert ants change to forest ants. And when they find a lot of pine needles, they build an ant hill by collecting the needles and throwing them away if they carry too many. In nature, there are many strategies to, that lead to complex structures, for instance, in the emergence of ferromagnetism, and other strategies, for instance, for finding connections between different places can also be found, both easy and hard. Second, I would like to show a few examples of how to use pixels. Maybe we already know the RGB model, for instance, from experiments with random graphics. After that, we will start again very simple. As an introduction to the topic, we look for the old stars in the galaxies here. They shine in the red spectrum. We have to try out some parameters, what is red, and apply the result to all pixels with map over. We try it out, that's an image, and that's the red center, and we can use other blocks to define what is red. We can do very similar things like grayscale images, contrast enhancements, and so on. Next, we modify the procedure and try to identify faces and photos as a preparation for face recognition. 
To do this, we need to define what we want to call a skin color and quickly discuss what discrimination of people with slightly different skin color might be built into the process. We do that. We take a photo from a street scene and apply this script with map over the pixels of this custom. And we find a lot of faces in this photo in different quality. We can now remove single points, look for larger areas which might be faces in the photo and so on, but that are different tasks. In order not to get into trouble with personal rights, we choose a picture of an unknown passenger. We choose this and apply the process. And now we could try to uh, delete this point, this white points, and here are some black points perhaps, and the students have enough to do. Finally, we can use the image sprite from my machine learning library for the same process. We detect the face and send a convolution kernel over the image to determine the edges of the contours. That would be a simple way to determine the proportions of the face. We find the face, then we import the data to the image sprite and apply the convolution kernel and display the result on a new clone of the image sprite. And then we have the contours. Once we have learned this operation, they can be used in more advanced procedures. A simple traffic sign recognition algorithm divides the image of the traffic sign into four squares, performs a pooling operation and passes the mean values of the colors as input values to a neural network. Its learning behavior can be observed. The neural net changes the colors of its nodes and connections if the weights of the neurons are changed. Let's do this. We have here Paul, the controller. Paul is the only sprite with scripts. The scripts of Paul seems to be short. This is the initialization of the neural net and other uh, sprites. And what has the net to perform is that it should be teached by Paul. Let's have a look on the teaching. Teaching process is simple. We choose a traffic sign, show it on the stage, and get some training data and input data. Input data are the pooling and the means of the colors, and uh, we get 12 values from this process. And the training data is the correct number of the traffic sign. And the, the important block is learn from, the neural nets learn from input data to get the tra uh, training data correct. The learning rate in this pro uh, process can be changed here. We can set it about to 50 or so percent in the beginning, and uh, then we should do a second run with a, a smaller learning rate. So we try to teach the net. We change different, we choose different uh, traffic signs, and as you can see, the weights of the net begins to change. We have to take some time for this process. We have 25 
learning process is still now, and it should be 50. And uh, that seems to be stable. We choose a uh, smaller learning ride for a second run. And if this is ready, the uh, neural net is tested very similar. We choose also traffic signs and read the result of the net and test whether the number is the same as the number of the uh, actual custom of the traffic sign. And we count the success. Now we have 47. Okay, and now we begin to test the net. Till now we have success 100%. Now we have some errors, but it becomes better result in time. And if we take more time for training the net, we get about 100% correct identified signs. Now we will have a look on a convolutional network. The purpose of this system is to reduce the data of an image that can be analyzed by a smaller neural net. The convolutional network is formed here by the entire stage. It should recognize the handwritten numbers 0 and 1. At the top of the stage, you can either enter such characters or load them as an image file. In this case, I have given two kernels for convolution. One recognizes vertical edges, the other horizontal here. The mapping process then takes place several times in three steps. First, the kernels are applied to the image, which results in two feature maps here, here and here. That are the feature maps. Then a rectifying linear unit is performed at this point. This has the purpose of resolving the direct connection between training data and the results so that the network can later generalize what has been learned. That means also classify new images correctly. Finally, a pooling process takes place which reduces the amount of data. That was the first pass. In the second pass, the same kernels are applied to the feature maps of the previous level. Here and here. As a result of the three steps, we get feature maps that say, for example, that there is both a vertical and horizontal edge in that part of the image, possibly a corner. Since the resulting feature maps here, the form, are very small, I have enlarged the last ones a little. You can see that even in the simple model where the kernels are not trained, there are differences in the order in which they are used. Finally, the mean values of the pixel values are calculated and passed to a neural net. This is some trained. Let's try it. It takes it some time, but you can see that the weights in the net change here. We have not enough time. We stop the training here and test the net now. Stop learning. And now I try to draw an image of a zero letter. Oh. And I have luck. The zero was detected correctly. But that wasn't just luck. I prefer to save a second try. The convolutional network was covered in the lecture because the students asked for it. 
They can understand all the substeps like pooling, convolution and so on, because these occurred before and are available as finished blocks in the library. Let's have a look on it. Analyze image is here and we have blocks for convolution, relu and pooling and this happened two times, the rest is uh, showing the results and so on. The last sequence deals with balls. At the beginning we need a single ball which moves with a velocity components in x and y direction and which is reflected at the edges. To be able to follow the path, we lower the pen of the ball. This actually works quite well. We can add some gravity or friction to the simulation. Let's stop it. Add gravity. And add some friction. And start again. This looks good at first, but if you wait a little bit, the ball may not behave like a real one in some situations. It is worthwhile to analyze the reasons for this in detail. If we look at the ball as a drop of water and let it pass, for example, a layer of sand in which it is observed with a certain probability p, then we can discuss whether we have found a useful model for diffusion. And if we let many balls of different colors fly and collide with each other, then we can study gas matches, for example. But we are also quickly pushing SNP to its limits. The gas model can unfortunately actually be expanded to simulate a pandemic. There are green healthy people and red infected people who become yellow immune after the seroconversion period. The model can easily be extended in different directions. We can change the probability of infection, for example, by wearing a mask, modifying the range of people, introduce super spreaders, and so on. The model is, of course, extremely simple. But right now it offers cause for slight discussions. The simulation of a pendulum also is simple. When presenting the measurement results, the simplified approximate solution can easily be drawn additionally in green. And if you want to have it really hard, then we attach a second pendulum to the first one and create a chaotic system. The last example comes from a completely different topic, which can also be illustrated with balls. It is the connectivity according to Barabasi. If we connect generated nodes of a network at different times and color connected nodes in the same way, we get random networks or scale free networks whose properties can be represented and examined, for instance, in the direction of small worlds or network stability. First, we try to create a random network. That can we do if we first create nodes and then connect them with links. And if we have a look on the diagram, we have something like a Poisson diagram as expected. Here are the links per node shown. We can create another form of diagram on network if we first create nodes and then links, and then nodes and then links, and then nodes and then links. Now I have a growing network. And if we do this and have a look on the diagram, it's completely different. 
It's something if I have enough notes uh, like a piano diagram. Okay, that was the choice. What is the summary? Snap is great because it allows you to display everything that is important and hide the unimportant. The context of the project is visualized by various media components without much effort, so that the actual work can focus on the core of the problem. The algorithmic structures are transparent and clear and the advanced concepts are impressive. I am particularly enthusiastic about the fact that it is possible with the help of a simple example that explains the necessary components for working in a context to let the students work independently from the beginning, which makes them highly motivated and proud of their own results. SNAP is so good that it is not necessary to push itself into the foreground. SNAP is a great tool to teach well. But it is not the topic. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, thanks, Eckhart, for your um, keynote. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And now we're up for questions. Um, so there was one, Eckhart, um, whether you would be able to um, add the projects to the SNAP collection for SnapCon 20. Of course, um, yes. Great. So yeah. that's covered. <laughs> um, any more questions? Okay. Can I uh, say something before? Ah, sorry. Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm very honored to be invited to speak at this great conference. But as you have heard, I unfortunately, I can hardly speak English. And um, that was the reason for the video, and I hope that Yadga will save me in the following discussion by interpreting a bit. And pardon, please, my little French accent. <laughs> I guess we're perfectly fine with that. Okay, questions, guys. Yeah. Okay, Max wants to let you know that it's really cool that you included also the importance of kids being proud of their students being proud of their work. Um, you know, Max wollte noch mal darauf hinweisen, dass es klasse ist, dass du mm. gesagt hast, dass äh, Leute auch stolz auf ihr Werk sind. <clears throat> ah, Jens, maybe you want to take that. John asks whether the new SNAP version will be able to handle larger numbers of bouncing balls. Uh, actually, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I would love to make that experiment, but I think I saw from Eckhart's keynote that he was already using the new version <laughs> for that. So uh, maybe it used to be even less before. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, if you want, I want to say some sentences uh, for this lecture. Um, it's a bit special and uh, there are no computer sciences, but there are really uh, students from all faculties. And that means that uh, the, uh, the competences between uh, the lecturer and the audio, uh, auditory is slip, is swip, uh, changed, switched, uh, switched yes. And uh, <clears throat> because the students are the expert, not I. And I try to understand what the students want to do in their subject. And they, it's, uh, these are very interested and interesting person. They all, they normally, they are uh, master students or PhD students, and they work all the day with a computer, and the computer says 1.0 as a result, and they have no idea how this result was calculated, and they want to know how it works. And <clears throat> the, the sense of this uh, lecture is not so much to, to teach uh, specialities of, of uh, computer science, but to, uh, but to uh, learn that they are able to uh, build applications in their field of study. And they uh, learn the 
uh, it's a question of time, how complex uh, the problems that they deal with will be. If they take enough time, they deal with uh, complex uh, uh, problems, and uh, some of them do. And uh, what I think is uh, important is that they learn that in computer science, almost always, there are different solutions for the same problem. And because uh, all, pro uh, all um, applications have, for instance, social impacts, it's possible to change your impacts by, by uh, choosing another solution. And it uh, almost uh, all times is, it's uh, uh, something like um, results without alternatives uh, doesn't exist in computer science. There are alternatives. And uh, if one says there are no alternatives, then there's another form of saying shut, shut up. And um, what they also can learn is the level of, of knowledge they need to discuss, uh, for instance, a social problem. Uh, if we take the neural networks in this course, they uh, maybe they have to know there are uh, LSTM networks, but they know uh, haven't to know the details of them, but they uh, only have to know that the current versions of neural networks uh, calculate functions. And they have a lot of parameters, and the parameters have to be adjusted, and then they uh, deliver a result uh, if they get an input. And uh, for instance, LSTM networks do this more efficient than other forms, and that's enough. And they can then discuss any social impacts, for instance, on the one side from their field of study, from their subject, but also from the side of computer sciences. And uh, I think that is important for educated uh, ones. Okay, Eckhart, um, we have two more questions. But mm -hmm. finish your sentence, sorry. Uh, yes, I uh, think it's it, extremely important that the most features of uh, SNAP um, are, uh, uh, you get access by intuition and intuition. What's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, intuition. Yeah, intuition. And um, so I have only spent a small amount of time for SNAP and have almost the whole time to discuss the fields of uh, this applications we talk about or do it or build it in the uh, field. And it's um, extremely interesting for me to see the young people uh, to be expert in their fields and I learn from them I, and I hope that I can help them. As I do it as far as I'm, I, I, I'm mm. able to. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's so great to hear and I totally agree with what you said. So there were two more questions. One is, do you use TensorFlow for your machine learning blocks? No. Um, the, the, um, I read uh, and I know what TensorFlow is and what's the most in interesting thing for me was a book from Godfellow who, uh, uh, who talked about um, old proof from Marvin Minsky that uh, all the uh, neural networks are equivalent to final state machines. And uh, that means uh, what we uh, talking about are complex um, uh, Getränkeautomat. Uh. <laughs> vending machines, uh, software and vending drinks. machines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> something on this level and not about brain, brains in the present state. Maybe and what can be, um, maybe uh, uh, that uh, very big systems uh, will have something, will do something uh, emergence and new features uh, will, uh, will um, entstehen. 
um, emerge. Emerge. New, new features that, that may be, uh, but I don't understand this if I uh, try to uh, teach a, a TensorFlow uh, system to, to, to learn traffic signs. Maybe I understand something about, I uh, uh, take other big systems like gases or, or, or maybe ferromagnetism or so, where um, emergence happens. And uh, what will emer emerge? I don't know. And I think I, uh, that's a philosophical question, not a technical. Okay. But, so, um, but, wait, 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 but you just wrote it yourself. The yeah. neural network, right? Uh, uh, you just wrote it. You programmed it yourself. You didn't use a library. You just wrote. Yes, the, yes, yes, yes. I the, was a bit confused by the uh, letter from uh, from um, Cook and um, who was it? Um, there were uh, some years ago. Uh, uh, group of important persons said it, it's dangerous to deal with neural networks. And I did this many years ago when I was young and had long hair. And um, I uh, wanted to, to, um, to, to understand what happens uh, with the new big and deep networks. And the best way for me is to, to build one. Then I understood it. Okay, and then we had one more question, which I also find kind of interesting. Um, did you ever come across a physics phenomenon that you wanted to do in SNAP but couldn't because SNAP wasn't powerful enough? No. <laughs> yeah. no uh, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, SNAP is enough fast. And uh, I think um, the, the worstful thing is, uh, the, is to build a model to think about it and then it would be nice uh, if it uh, gives a result after a certain time but I drink about four liters coffee a day and uh, if I get some time for this I have no problem with it uh, but you, uh, the image processing uh, needs uh, of, of course a lot of uh, power and it's fast it's, uh, you get a result by pressing a button Okay, and uh, I would have one not more come. question. What was uh, the... May I give a short comment? Sorry, Achim. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, I mostly agree with Eckhart's approach, and I did similar things in computer art. So I always introduced one new concept with one new uh, art project. Um, and so I started with very simple turtle graphics and introduced more concept one after another. But on the other hand, for me personally, it was um, very important to learn more about the um, uh, programming language concepts because that allowed me afterwards to make uh, better solutions to the projects I had already done and to plan new projects only possible with these new concepts. So it's a bit tricky uh, between those, uh, between those things, um, you always have to think about the tool also to get ideas what is more possible uh, in your content area. Yes. Uh, uh, for uh, example, if I have a group of students and we uh, want to to uh, work on a, uh, on a project. And then there occur special questions for special computer science tricks or so. Then I have an audience and uh, which immediately will understand how the solution works. I, 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 there's no, I need no time to motivate them to, to handle, to deal with this solution or with, with this part of computer science. They want to know it. And if I'm able to, I tell them there are this uh, toolbox of another sort and uh, use this and try it out. Um, it's very efficient to, to, uh, to, to work uh, then with the tool and it sometimes it's necessary, of course. Okay. 
Okay, okay. More questions? Are there plans for a compiled version of Snap? That's probably a question for Jens. Um, <clears throat> I don't even know. Um, there are, there is a, a just-in-time compiler built in for certain higher order functions. It's still experimental, but there are design trade-offs to that. Um, so in general, I'd say, uh, no, not really. Uh, we want kind of liveness is more important. So we can tweak speed for certain things, but um, to make something kind of compiled to a different language uh, that is no longer interactive, uh, I think that takes away the point of snap. If we take an example, if uh, I map over a function over the pixels of an image, uh, half a year, last year or so, I would uh, do it with JavaScript. But it doesn't matter now, Jens' uh, uh, compiled version is faster, as, uh, as, far, uh, as far as I see. Uh, there are some situations to the questions before. If I uh, w dealing with cellular automata, I need uh, the, the cells around a special cell. And uh, then I, uh, as far as I see in the older versions, Jens, uh, uh, the compiled uh, map of map of map doesn't work. And then I uh, begin yeah, to cry, and after that I take JavaScript. Okay, Eckhart, there's one more question. How would you translate your way, way into primary education? I think there are no, not so much uh, differences. Zoo came from level three and four. And um, the one problem occurred that the kids uh, told that it was very nice to automate or everything, but uh, they wanted to have time before to play with the uh, with, uh, animals and the zoo. And um, uh, just now I would understand it because my grandkids are in this age, but there they weren't and uh, now I uh, would have known this. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, we can learn from this physical computing. The, the uh, area of problems that you can uh, imagine if you see a context, a zoo or a castle or so, makes it possible that you choose your own problems, but the problems, uh, the teacher before uh, uh, chose the, uh, the, the context and he, he has to, to calculate what is able in this context and what's not. But in this context, the, the children are free. And uh, that, that is possible in, uh, for all ages. And then there's one more question from um, Hagai who wants to know whether you have ideas or any success stories to share on how you convinced other teachers in non-computer science subjects to also infuse com computation in their subjects. Maybe you can also share the story how you convinced the people in Niedersachsen to allow SNAP for their final exams. <laughs> because I like that success story. Yes, uh, the, uh, Annika can tell something <laughs> to that about Niedersachsen, Louis Saxony. And uh, the, um, the first question was? Uh, um, yes. how, how you, can you convince teachers from non-computer science subjects to do something like the yeah. Zoo project in biology, for example? Yeah. So, um, the pictures from the kids with um, uh, Admiral Franklin's boat, that I think that was a good project. It was science, integrated sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, and computer science in uh, the same block. And uh, the main uh, task for the teachers, that was not my, that was a colleague for me, um, 
she had uh, kids of the same age and know it much better than I was to, to, to write good stories. Also in this case, we had uh, two, two in the story, we have uh, kids uh, just of the same age as a learning group and they found documents in the story that it might be that they are late relatives to Admiral Franklin standing on his ship and uh, running northwest and never was seen again. And um, the, what is, was fascinating for me to, to see the, uh, how the kids dreamt in the story, is it correct? Uh, they they uh, they had the dream that they are acting in the story, and then they found problem how to navigate on the sea, and what about the ice bear babies? And uh, uh, at first, I had a little or orca that also uh, looked to, to the ice bear babies, but uh, the the pedagogical uh, censorship deleted this orca. And um, the story, as uh, the, the kids acted in the story and found it uh, meaningful to solve the maybe uh, physical uh, uh, problems that acute. Okay, that all sounds awesome. I mean, I've seen some of your work, and it, it is awesome. All check out Eckhart's website, who was posted, uh, which was posted in the chat multiple times. Um, it has links to all his uh, books and the SQL Snap version and the projects that he've show, he's shown today. You can download them as zip files there. And as there are no more questions, I would like to uh, end his MOOC on OpenSAP, which is unfortunately only available in German. But um, the projects are still cool, and you can download them. Um, then I'd say thanks for your attention. We're now heading off to the break. And um, that is for Yatka, she saved my life. Oh, thanks, Yatka. <laughs> oh. um, and uh, we'll see you in the buffs then. Thank you, Yatka.